I received this email from a listener. She said, I have been encouraged by the Parenting to Impress podcast, especially in the way that you and Melanie both keep the big picture long term in mind. Doing so in the little years is tough when you're constantly being pulled in a million directions. She goes on to say, in the podcast about sex and sexuality, I was convicted about first planting the seeds of talking about sin with my kids. Do you have any tips or insight on talking to young children about sin without discouraging doom and gloom? I feel my kids get overwhelmed and tune out with the topic of sin. Can you provide some ideas? Welcome back to Parenting to Impress, your go-to podcast to learn practical ways to love God and love others, and impress this on the hearts of your children. I am your host, Heidi Franz, and I am joined by my dear friend, Melanie Simpson, two moms who have made a lot of mistakes, but have found grace and truth along the way. Melanie, this mom brings up a great point, talking about sin. Is it necessary? Gosh, I wish it weren't. (laughs) It would make discipling little kids especially a lot easier. But at the end of the day, if our goal is to introduce our children and to lead them to Christ, we have to talk about sin. Yeah. We cannot separate the gospel message from sin. First of all, what is sin? This is how I describe it to kids in preschool. Sin is the bad choices we make. Mm -hmm. It's when we choose to do what we want instead of what God wants. Now, for little kids, I explain that as our parents are who God has put in charge of us. Right. And so when we do not obey our parents, then we are not obeying God. Yeah. Also, when we are not loving other people with respect. And so we go to 1 Corinthians 13, four through nine, talking about that love is kind, love is patient, love does not demand its own way. So anytime we're not obeying our parents, anytime we're not loving our siblings or other people, that is sin. And I would say the next step is to remind them that we all sin. I mean, that's in found in Romans, several places that mommy and daddy are sinners. You are a sinner. It's not just that you're the only one. Absolutely. Your word choice is bad choices. If that doesn't sit well with you, say wrong choices mm-hmm. or call it disobedience. That's up to you. But the idea is to convey that we are called to love God. And like Heidi said, love others. So anything we do, things we think that's down the road that disrupt that love of God and love others, that's sin. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But I think where we struggle, Melanie, is we see our little babies and we go, yeah, but not them, right? Sure. Looking at any little angelic infant face, especially when they're sleeping. (laughs) We cannot fathom that this creature that cannot speak, that cannot do anything for itself, how can they sin? But scripture tells us that sin entered the world at the fall of humanity, which was within the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. We now all are under the curse of sin. Everybody, any human being is under the curse of sin. And that right there is the reason why we must talk about sin with our kids. Mm -hmm. Because sin is in them. Sin is in us. It's in our world, and thus we need to be explaining it to our kids in a way that they can understand. Okay, so what is sin? It's the wrong choices, the disobedience. Who sins? We all sin. And, you know, it's easy, I think, Melanie, to point the finger at the world and go, well, if I can just keep my child away from sin, then there won't be the problem. Right. But the issue is the sin is in them. Right. So even if you went to Alaska and lived 50 miles from anybody, there's still going to be sin in your home. Yep. Because there is sin in us. Everybody sins. The sin is in us. And it's things that go against God and against Mm -hmm. others. So what's the solution? And this is where we get the joy of presenting Christ to them. This is the blessing we have to say, guess what? God made a way for this to all be made right. And we get to share Jesus with our kids. This is called discipleship. Absolutely. I was convicted one time in listening to a speaker talk about the wrong choices that our children make. 
And we can look at those wrong choices and get incredibly frustrated, especially when they happen over and over again. Or we can look at them as opportunities to point our children to Christ. And I thought, wow, what a difference that view is in parenting to see mistakes as opportunities instead of inconveniences. Let's break this down by age. Preschool, elementary teens. How do we teach our children about sin and their need of a savior? Let's start with preschoolers. So as you said earlier, this is the time where we model obedience versus disobedience, Mm -hmm. right? This is the training. In order for our children to move from kind of the tangible world around them into the spiritual world, spiritual development, we need to help them just get the basics, the, the, the physical idea that when mommy or daddy or teacher or whatever says, go, you go, stop, you stop, et cetera. When you grab your brother or sister by the hair and pull (laughs) and they are screaming, there is a very clear natural consequence for the way you lashed out in selfishness or anger. Talk about these things. Is it going to be a one and done conversation? No, you are going to have the same kind of conversation over and over and over again. But this is the first layer of many, we've talked about this before in other podcasts, that gives children a concrete understanding of wrong, right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's called morality. We are giving our children that first foundation of what does God want from us Mm -hmm. versus what does God not want us to do? Mm -hmm. It's the behavior modification. Yes, which in theory, we don't ever want to stay here. Yes. So that's why I say it's the first layer, but you can't have the spiritual formation in children. You can't have the spiritual formation until those practical things, Mm -hmm. those concrete tangibles have been met. Very good. So one of the things that I want to encourage you to do is use the words that the Bible uses with these preschoolers. Use the word sin. Use the word disobedience. Talk about forgiveness, grace, and mercy as you go about modifying their poor choices, Mm -hmm. their wrong decisions. Teachable moments are a great opportunity. That's where a situation happens. And instead of just telling the child, no, stop, you get to the heart of the issue and talk about why did you do that? What happened when you did that? We use teachable moments to talk about apologizing Mm -hmm. and teaching the kids. When you tell a child, I want you to apologize, first of all, that doesn't have any meaning until you've given them words. So we taught our children to say, I am sorry for blank. Will you please forgive me for blank? How can I help? you Mm -hmm. because I write blank. And you and I both know at three, Mm -hmm. our children probably don't have an actual grasp on forgiveness, right? Because there's spirit, the Holy Spirit that that compels and moves believers Mm -hmm. to extend forgiveness, to Mm -hmm. accept forgiveness has probably not indwelt them yet because they have not turned their life to Christ. Yeah. And apology is just words for them. Right. But again, it is the practical hands-on training that is that first layer. And likewise, when you have had a short temper or a short fuse, you've made a mistake. It sticks out so clearly. I accused my five-year-old of something that my three-year-old had done. Oh, and as, as it kind of came out, the truth, the truth will out, as Shakespeare says, I had to go back to my five-year-old and apologize. And you know, I said, the Holy Spirit convicted me, son, and I am so sorry. And I, I'm repenting. I'm going to ask forgiveness of God and I'm going to ask you to forgive me too. So that example. Yes. But I love too, Heidi, you are so good about talking about um, emotions. We want to tell our kids about mm-hmm. emotions and, and they're God given, but not to be ruled by them. Mm-hmm. So saying, I can see that you are really angry right now. Mm-hmm. You are sibling. What's mm-hmm. going on here? Mm-hmm. Give them a chance to talk about it. And then like you said, let's get to the heart of this. How can we love your sibling well, 
even while you're angry. Yeah. Be angry, but sin not. And so helping children understand that. I think in the preschool time, it's very important to be finding examples of this. Uh, Curious George and the man with the yellow hat is a prime example of the man with the yellow hat would tell Curious George to do something. And Curious George disobeyed every single Mm -hmm. time. I want to caution. We want to be careful that we don't call sin funny. Mm. We don't laugh yeah, yes. at sin. Yeah. I remember one time that my child was doing something and I mean, it was a flat out disobedience and inside me, I was giggling because it was so over the top, but sin is never cute. Disobedience is never funny. And so we want to be very careful that we don't encourage our children to sin because of the chubby cheeks right. and the funny things they're saying. Or that we post it and share for the world that we are making a mockery of sin by laughing at it. And it hurts my heart, honestly, to see so many videos of kids disobeying, mm-hmm. sinning for a laugh. So looking for those teachable moments to be explaining what sin is and consequences of sin, whether it's in books or movies. With elementary age kiddos, we're moving beyond the behavior modification and starting to look at the need for a savior. Mm -hmm. Now, some of you may go, well, I'm doing that with my preschooler. Fantastic. Absolutely. We want to be starting this with the preschooler. But in elementary, it's no more do this because I say do it. Now we're starting to look at the why. Right. You think about your typical elementary age child, their world is opening up. Mm -hmm. Whatever your school choice is, there are going to be more people in their lives. They're going to be exposed to more things. And so it's just natural that your conversation is going to grow. It's going to encompass more things. Um, They are developing an awareness of the world around them. And so again, it's a wonderful time to remind them you are a sinner and there is sin in the world. And how do we tackle that? Only through Jesus Christ. And it's also a time where we begin to engage their thoughts, their ideas. We want to raise thinking theologians. Mm -hmm. We don't want these blind sheep. We want sheep that are faithful to the Lord, but who can have conversations about their faith. Begin asking those questions and pulling things apart. This is not a one and done. It's another layer. And speaking of not one and done, this is when it really starts to come out in your children of these issues that they keep running back to. Yep that they have strong ties to. Maybe they get angry really easily. Maybe they are not organized and are continually struggling with being late and not being ready. And so what we want to do is help our children see that they need help and pointing them back to the help that God can provide them because of the sin in their life. And using the example of God wants to sand off those rough edges Mm -hmm. and he wants to be the sandpaper. Yeah. And it's not fun, but he's gentle. Yes. And the outcome is always for our good and for his glory. And so we can rest in the knowing that unlike a lot of the things in the world that are hard and the outcome is not great, Mm. when we are being submissive to sanctification, which is what Heidi was calling Mm -hmm. the sandpaper, the outcome is always better. It's always better. What you were saying earlier, Heidi, about the issues that our children have, you have to be a student of your own child. Mm -hmm. Here's the good news, bad news. Every kid in your house is different. I don't care how similar they are, their sin issues, the ones that kind of rise to the top are going to be different. And so it is up to you and your spouse to really get to know your kids. Yeah, very true. You were talking about apologizing and we were talking about giving words to our kids on how to apologize. I think there's also during the elementary age is when we start confessing our sins, showing our kids how to deal with sin, 
and how we on a personal level are dealing with sin. Yeah. So let's use for an example that you are not, as an adult, you are not making healthy choices. Maybe it's you're not exercising, you're eating poorly, and to confess to your kids, this is something that I'm struggling with. This is how I'm dealing with it. Mm -hmm. I think in the teenage years, talking about sin is a great time to talk about accountability. Mm -hmm. Because when we're stuck in sin, what does God call us to do? Call on the body of Christ to help us, to hold us accountable. Right. If we are struggling with something, we're going to confess that to our kids and we're going to show them what accountability looks like and being willing to have accountability. Mm -hmm. And I know you didn't mean it this way, but I'm just going to pick on it for a second. You said, I'm struggling with, and I would just say, take the word struggling out to say, I am sinning by oh, I love that. mistreating my body. Yeah. Um, I know that it is the Lord's temple. You know, scripture tells us that, and I am right. sinning by over consuming, under using it and in a way that is not going to help the longevity of my body. And I want my body to be strong so that I could serve the Lord for as many days wow. as he's given me. And I, I'm guilty of it too. So I'm not just picking no, it on I, you. I'm so glad you said that, Melanie, because isn't that just what we do? Mm -hmm. We call a sin cute. Mm -hmm. We call a sin struggle. We just diminish the, yes. the, the levity of it. I mean, it is, it's a big deal. In reality, it is a choice that I am making. Yes. Yeah. It is a choice my child is making. And I think that's the other thing too, is the root of all sin is the unwillingness to be submitted humbly to the Lord. And at the end of the day, each and every one of us have a choice to make. Is God the king of my life? Is he the only one on the throne of my heart or is he not? Because I'll tell you, he will not share the throne. He is a God who is jealous for us. And that simply means that he desires all of us. Elementary and teen years are the best time to model. I understand. I get what you're what you're going right. through because right. today when I was at work and in the break room, everybody was chattering about Susie and what, what happened to Susie over the weekend. And I stood there and I listened. Mm -hmm. And I confess to you, son, I actually chimed in. I gossiped. I flat out gossiped. I talked about this woman and her business as if it was, you know, something to be chatted about. And it is was wrong with sin. I love what you said is just having the conversations. We used an act. So it's adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And we would do that when we homeschooled. We do it similarly now just at the dinner table. It's just a sweet way to help our kids stay grounded to the truth that God loves them. He is worthy of worship. Mm -hmm. He is worthy of confession. Yeah. And that he is also worthy of interceding for one another. So as the person across the table, my husband confesses a sin for the day, I can pray for him in that moment. It doesn't have to be complicated, I guess is what I'm really getting at. You were talking about humility just a few moments ago. I think during the teen years, it's that amazing opportunity to call humility what it is and pride what it is. Mm -hmm. Pride is a sin. Mm -hmm. humility is laying down our pride. It's not thinking of ourselves less because that's still pride. It is that idea of, I have sinned also. God has forgiven me and I don't consider myself better. We're all in the same boat yeah. in need of a savior. And that's a huge thing for teens because in teen culture, it's frowned upon to think that you're better than somebody else. Mm -hmm. Teens are very defensive about mm -hmm. being better than someone else. And the other side, of course, is that most of the time they all think they're better than somebody else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's important that when we approach our teens, we approach them with the understanding that I'm speaking to you. I'm not trying to speak to your friend group or to your school. I'm speaking to you. I want to be curious about you. What does God think about this? What do you think about this? What are you feeling about your walk with the Lord? And as you have those conversations, you'll be surprised at what comes out that you can then say, 
yeah, that's sin. Mm-hmm. Let's hash but that I think out. In order to, for us to ask those tough questions, we have to be willing to ask those tough questions of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And we have to be in accountability. Mm-hmm. We have to be in discipleship mm-hmm. groups where people are asking those questions of us. Yeah. Because otherwise it comes off as arrogance. Hypocrisy. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's a great point, Heidi. You know, we're going from toddlers to elementary, middle, high school. What you're hearing us say is it's layer upon layer upon mm-hmm. layer. Nothing new. For those of you who have been listening to the podcast, we're a big fan of layers, layered cake, <laughs> layered ice cream. You yourself have to be in relationship with God so that you have an awareness of your own right. sin, so that you have the ability to say, I confess, I'm doing this too, and inviting those conversations. You know, I'm just thinking about the woman who's going, okay, but I don't want my child to be filled with shame. All they're hearing is that's a bad choice, bad choice, bad choice. You know, how, so how do we walk that line between teaching them rightly about sin and not falling into this ditch where like they spend the rest of their lives having to get rid of the shame that they they heaped upon as a child? Oh, I love that question on so many levels. I think shame comes when forgiveness doesn't follow. Hmm. Shame comes when somebody is pointing their finger It's kind of the imagery that I have in my brain right now of you did wrong, Mm -hmm. you failed, you messed up. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the child's identity, which you can say, well, but Heidi, you said at the beginning that in their makeup is sin. Yes, it is. But their identity is a child of God. Mm. To get rid of that sin is a desire to glorify God. Shame is you messed up. There's no hope. Right. Shame says, I am bad. Yes. I am unacceptable. Something in me is so, so bad, so unworthy. From a Christian perspective, that's actually true. You are flawed. Right. You are unacceptable as you are. But the gospel says, grace says, Mm -hmm. I love you where you are. I love you flawed. I love you unacceptable because I'm going to give you Jesus's righteousness. I'm going to give you his love and his grace and his mercy. And then you are acceptable to me. I think about the two ditches. We've got the ditch that is, it is all grace. It is all love. And then we've got the ditch of shame on you. You failed. You messed up. Right. And John chapter one says that Jesus was grace and truth, both. Mm -hmm. When we get into a ditch is when our kids don't understand what sin is, when they ignore what sin is, when they are abusing grace versus the other ditch where they have the shame. Mm -hmm. And so we need to come together. And I think that happens on the road of relationships. Absolutely. When we are walking alongside of them through their journey, just like God's walking alongside us through our journey. Yeah. I just want to close by saying none of us get this right all the time. Oh goodness. No. I would say the the victories we celebrate are probably few and far between. Mm-hmm. But the best news of all is our God is a redeemer and a restorer. The times that you feel like that did not land the way I intended. We did not connect. He misunderstood me. She's not getting it. We, by faith, believe that God will move for that child's good and for his glory. And so we can trust him to be faithful. And he is a promise keeper. Scripture tells us again and again and again of all the promises he's fulfilled. And one of the promises that he gives us is that when we are obedient to him, he will do work in our hearts. He is transforming us. We just rest in that. I mean, that's as much for me (laughs) as it is for anybody listening. But there is peace in knowing that our God is a restorer and a redeemer. We want to thank you for listening to the Parenting to Impress podcast. Be sure to visit abcjesuslovesme.com and check out the show notes for more information on topics shared in this episode. Please subscribe and share with your friends.